Hey guys, this is Shruti Dure from THB here at Dallas, Texas, and in honor of American Heart Month, we had the amazing opportunity to talk to Dr. David Goff for our February issue. Dr. Goff is the Director of Cardiovascular Sciences at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. With NHLBI, he leads a diverse team of scientists and administrators committed to turning discovery into cardiovascular health. He is also an elected member of the American Epidemiological Society, along with being a fellow of the American College of Physicians and the American Heart Association. Today, Summerth Cobber, one of our editors here at THB, will be talking to Dr. Goff to get us the answers to all our questions about cardiovascular health straight from the source. So let's get to it. All right. Uh, on behalf of the THB magazine, I'd really like to say uh, it's an honor to have you today. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be with you. All right. So my first question, uh, why is cardiovascular health such a big problem specifically here in the United States? Well, um, cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death in our country and around the world. So uh, it's a really big deal. Now, you know, we've had decades of success. So since about the mid 60s, uh, there's been a reduction by almost 70% in deaths due to heart disease and stroke in the United States. But despite that progress, uh, heart disease remains the leading cause of death in our country and, in fact, the leading cause of death in the world. So um, that makes it a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. And now with the pandemic going on, that rates have spiked even, uh, for other things besides heart disease. But with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, has the impact of heart disease changed at all? Because people have been really focused on the coronavirus pandemic and they're starting to ignore these crazy diseases like heart disease. So could you highlight the impact of heart disease even during the pandemic? Yeah, this is really important. We've learned that there's this negative cycle uh, between heart health and the impact of uh, the coronavirus. So what, what we're learning, and there's still a lot more to learn, is that people who don't have a good heart health status, uh, they have a much harder time with the coronavirus if they come in contact with it than people who have good heart health. And we're also learning that the virus has a bad effect on the heart, at least in some people, perhaps in many. Uh, we're still learning more about that. And the way this seems to work is that people who already have heart disease, maybe they've had a heart attack in the past, or they have risk factors for heart disease, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes. Uh, people with these conditions are much more likely to have a tough time if they catch the virus. And by tough time, I mean, they're more likely to end up in the hospital. They're more likely to end up on the ventilator. They're less likely to make it home alive if they have these heart disease conditions or risk factors uh, and they run into this virus. So it's really important to have a good heart health to minimize the impact of the virus if you come in contact with it. We're also learning that the virus has a bad effect on the heart. And it seems to do that in two ways at least. One is that the virus attacks the blood vessels throughout the body, all throughout the body. And uh, whether those blood vessels are in the brain or in the lungs or in the heart, and by attacking the blood vessels that are in the heart, uh, it, sets, it sets up a process of inflammation, drawing in cells that are there to try to repair the damage, but they also lead to causing some inflammatory damage that can cause fibrosis in the heart. And it looks like it's setting the stage for a condition that we call heart failure, weakening of the heart muscle. In addition, the virus, at least in some people, looks like it can directly infect the muscle cells in the heart, the cells that make the heart pump. And by directly infecting those muscle cells, it, uh, the virus can weaken the cells or kill them. Uh, and that can also contribute to heart failure down the roads. So this negative cycle between having poor heart health to start with, making the impact of the virus worse, and then the virus having bad effects on the heart, this is really a bad cycle. And mm -hmm. so it really makes having your heart health in as good a shape as possible yeah. during this time uh, more important than ever. Okay. So 
even if the coronavirus doesn't kill you, you still have a high morbidity on your heart. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. There are many people who survived the coronavirus, but months down the road are still having severe symptoms, some of which could be attributed to damage to the heart. Some people are complaining of um, severe fatigue, shortness of breath on exertion, the sorts of things that could be related to lung damage, could be related to heart damage, could be related to a little bit of both. So you spoke about how uh, previous history of heart disease or heart problems can uh, have the coronavirus make a that harsh, harsher impact on your heart. But let's say you don't have a history of heart disease. Does the coronavirus still affect your heart? Well, you know, we're, we're still learning more. Uh, but it looks like, again, this virus affects the blood vessels, attacks the blood vessels all throughout the body. And so that includes blood vessels in the heart. So uh, we're even seeing in evidence in young athletes, uh, there have been some studies of um, young athletes, football players and others who have contracted the coronavirus and, and then gone in to have studies done uh, sometime after. And we're seeing evidence of this inflammation in the heart that uh, we're really concerned about. We don't know what the long-term implications are yet because this virus has only been around about a year. But there's a lot of concern that in these individuals who are young, healthy athletes and are having difficulty returning to play, what you might call return to work, mm -hmm. that it may be um, something that's going to bother them long-term. Yeah, there's a lot of bad negative things. But even with the pandemic, it's, I can imagine it's improved awareness for healthcare among the general public by a lot. So have you noticed an increase in awareness for other healthcare topics like heart disease? Well, in fact, uh, some of the things we're seeing are that people are less uh, likely to, to seek health care uh, at present. You know, people are concerned that if they go to the doctor, they go to the hospital, they might end up being exposed to the virus. So we're seeing a drop off in preventive services um, across the board, not just for heart disease, but for many other conditions. And, and this is leading to some real concerns that there will be people who have not gone in and get, gotten their preventive services. And, um, you know, so some of these services are for detecting cancer or it is spread to the point of being a real problem, trying to catch that cancer early. And so with people putting off those kinds of, of um, services, there, there may be some real problems with cancer care. Well, the same thing's true with heart disease. People who are having symptoms, a little chest pain on exertion, a little shortness of breath on exertion, they're less likely to go in and to the, see the doctor or go to the hospital because they're concerned about the virus. Now, many... Um, I think it's important to know that doctors, uh, clinics, and hospitals are doing a really great job of separating patients out. So uh, the, the concern is greater than the reality, but people still have the concern. The other thing to, to point out is that doctors and hospitals are doing a great job of telehealth. Uh, we've seen a remarkable embrace of telehealth where people can see their doctor like you and I are talking now, and they can share their symptoms talk about how things are going and get a lot of the care they need. It doesn't completely replace face-to-face -face, uh, services, but it's been a real help. But it's also shined a, a real bright light on the fact that many people don't have the kind of technology that they need to participate in telehealth. They may not have a, a laptop computer or a, uh, or a smartphone or even if they have the technology, they may not have access to health care in their community or access to health care that has this kind of capacity in their community. So the social issues that um, have long plagued um, our communities have been brought into stark relief during the pandemic as it's had an impact on access to care for all kinds of conditions, including you know, the, the same social conditions have made some populations at greater risk for getting the coronavirus and at greater risk for having bad outcomes if they do get it, which, which just, by the way, makes it so important that people follow the, 
the kind of guidance we've been talking about now for about a year, you know, wear your mask, wash your hands, watch your distance when you're out and about. Those, those things are critically important. And when your turn comes, you know, get the vaccine. It might be a while for folks who aren't old enough to qualify for high risk status or don't have health conditions. But when, when your chance, when your turn comes, get the vaccine. Yeah. Uh, so you spoke a bit about how clinical healthcare during the pandemic is pretty hard to get and access to healthcare even before the pandemic is a huge issue. But as far as I know, the NHLBI doesn't offer clinical uh, services, but can you explain the role of the NHLBI, especially in improving heart disease and other things? Well, you're absolutely right. We're not a clinical um, healthcare organization. We're really more of a research organization. You know, we provide global leadership uh, for research, training, and education programs that promote prevention and treatment of heart, lung, blood, and sleep disturbances. Mm -hmm. So, um, and our goal is by generating that evidence and disseminating it uh, to enhance health of all uh, people that so they can live longer and healthier lives. Mm -hmm. So now specifically with respect to heart disease, um, and heart health, we've identified six pillars of our strategic mission implementation plan that is guiding where we're investing strategically. Mm -hmm. And the, the first one of those six is addressing social determinants of cardiovascular health and health inequity. And that one's first for a reason, because the, a lot of the problems we have with cardiovascular disease in our country are influenced by um, our social environment. So our social environment and our built environment, the physical environment, the um, chemical environment, they influence our health directly and they also constrain the behaviors, uh, the behavioral choices that people can pursue. For example, if you live in a community without good access to grocery stores, it's hard to eat a healthy diet. If you live in a community that doesn't have sidewalks and green spaces and it's hard to get out and get physical activity. If you live in a community where there's um, a lot of crime, again, it's hard to get out and get physical activity. Uh, so our environment really constrains our behaviors, and then our behaviors, uh, if they become constrained to unhealthy behaviors, uh, lead to an impact on our biology that results in, uh, in heart disease and other diseases. So it's really important that we address social determinants of cardiovascular health and health inequities. Mm -hmm. The other pillars are um, things like enhancing resilience, the concept that some people do well despite uh, adverse exposures. And so what can we learn from people who are resilient and then spread that knowledge? Promoting cardiovascular health across the lifespan from the twinkle to the wrinkle, from the very earliest aspects of life all the way to the end so that people can live healthy lives. And, and then we're focused on eliminating hypertension-related heart disease, reducing the burden of heart failure, and preventing uh, vascular dementia. So a lot of other things that we do and support, but by supporting those areas, we think we can really um, achieve two of our big goals. I mentioned that you know we've had decades of progress in reducing heart disease mortality, but over the past decade or so, we've seen stagnation in that progress. Um, and we believe that may have something to do with the obesity and diabetes epidemics. And so we really want to reignite the decline in cardiovascular disease mortality that has stalled out over the past decade or so. And we want to yeah. close the equity gap uh, that we're seeing in our country. So these, our big goals are reigniting the decline um, closing the equity gap, and we think these six pillars will help us get there. Okay. And these six pillars, uh, how do they relate to the work that you you and your team do at the Division of Cardiovascular Sciences as part of the NHLBI? Well, they're really having a big impact on the things that we're doing going forward, but we have, we're building a, a, on a real long legacy. So the, the Institute is over 70 years old. Uh, and um, during that period of time, uh, the, we've made major contributions, things like identifying the risk factors for heart disease. So you probably know that 
high blood pressure, high cholesterol, cigarette smoking, diabetes. These are important risk factors for heart disease. And mm -hmm. research we supported really helped identify those. And we've supported research that, that has helped demonstrate that lowering cholesterol, lowering blood pressure, that those translate into real improvements in cardiovascular disease and improvements in heart health. Mm -hmm. Now, more recently, we supported a study that um, provided evidence to lower the threshold for controlling blood pressure from 140 millimeters of mercury down to 130. Okay. And this is a really big deal because it, when this is implemented around the world, uh, it'll, it'll result in preventing tens of millions of um, heart attacks and strokes each year. Mm -hmm. So this is a, um, a, a study reported out within the past couple of years that's really gonna make a big difference. We yeah. also supported development of the DASH diet, which you may have heard of, that if people would follow the DASH diet more closely, it, uh, that just by that diet alone can lower blood pressure, keep it down, so avoid the need for blood pressure medication, yeah. also keep cholesterol down, avoid the need uh, for cholesterol-lowering medication. So these are just a couple of the things we're doing. We've also been supporting... Uh, studies that influence the way people are cared for once they develop disease and end up in the hospital, uh, how they're cared for their heart disease or their heart rhythm disturbance. And very recently, we supported a study that is really going to change the way people are treated for cardiac arrest when, when someone has sudden death outside the hospital. So many different things we're doing, all with that goal of uh, turning discovery into improved cardiovascular health, mm -hmm. reigniting the decline in cardiovascular disease mortality, and closing that equity gap. Yeah. So to summarize what you just said, it's mainly studies and research that goes on. Find out risk factors. And to educate the public. Yeah, right. Okay. So touching back on how you talked about obesity and how that's in the last, in the last decade, that's been preventing the progress. So um, comparing to the COVID vaccine, the COVID vaccines, they were developed really fast in record-breaking time and distributed to people around the globe. But a comprehensive treatment for heart disease has yet to be found. And even with all the progress that's been made, uh, what's been stopping the comprehensive treatment for heart disease? Yeah, well, you know, heart disease is very complicated um, and it's related to a lot of different exposures um, and it develops slowly over time. There are also multiple different forms of heart disease, but if, even if we take the most common cause, um, coronary heart disease, which is related to atherosclerosis, yeah. the kind of fatty buildup in the arteries of the body, the atherosclerosis starts in children. It starts in childhood and it progresses over the lifespan. And depending on how rapidly it progresses, um, yeah. it can cause people difficulty in their 30s or 40s or not until their 70s or 80s. And some people um, die of other causes without ever having any difficulty, but have atherosclerosis in their arteries, in their body. So it's a complex issue. Uh, it's... We, we have learned that the causes of atherosclerosis, if, if we think about human biology, is about having a, a cholesterol level too high, so that builds up plaque in the arteries, blood pressure levels too high, and that causes stress and damage on the arteries, and then insult to the arteries from things like cigarette smoking or viruses that set up um, damage to the artery in the first place. So these sorts of things uh, promote that form of heart disease. Now, those are the immediate causes, but the root causes are in social conditions, as we talked about a little while ago, that make it harder for some people to access healthy foods, make it um, such that adverse products like tobacco are disproportionately marketed in some communities more so than others. These are just examples of some of the social influences. So it's really difficult to say, we're going to have a pill that we're going to start giving children. They're going to take it all their lives to prevent a heart attack in their 50s or 60s. So what, we, what we're what we working toward 
is trying to improve cardiovascular health all along the spectrum, and that uh, all across the lifespan. And so that means for children, it's a focus primarily on improving diet, improving physical activity, uh, maintaining a healthy weight, a low level of, of uh, obesity. And, and that continues um, really through adolescence and young adulthood, where we're fo- the focus is primarily on healthy diet uh, to maintain a healthy blood pressure and a healthy cholesterol level, healthy weight level. And then once getting into teenage years, really trying to prevent uptake of smoking because cigarette smoking contributes to, to um, poor heart health. Yeah. It's very difficult to reverse the atherosclerosis once it's developed. So the uh, focus is on preventing it from the beginning. And then in middle age and older life, uh, using medications when needed to lower those uh, risk factors down to slow down the progression or halt the progression of atherosclerosis so that clinical event is postponed as late in life as possible, perhaps postponed to the point where it just doesn't occur uh, before death from some other cause. Yeah, so that's definitely the desired outcome. And just like the COVID vaccine, we want to prevent the virus or like prevent the disease before it occurs at the social and physical levels. So you don't have to deal with all the damage that occurs from heart disease. All right. Um, so it's right now it's American Heart Month and the purpose of American Heart Month right, is to spread awareness about heart disease, like we talked about. Prevent heart disease before it even occurs. And so before we finish it, would you give our audience a few different tips that people might want to take and use to keep their cardiovascular health in check? Sure. Uh, The great news is that heart disease is largely preventable. And um, there are a few things that people can do that will help keep their heart health in good shape. Um, The first one is to eat a healthy diet, like the DASH diet. And that's a diet that's uh, more plant based Mm -hmm. uh, and really cuts back on animal products and focuses on lean meats, uh, more fish and lean meats than uh, fatty meats, but it's really more Mm -hmm. plant-based. So then being physically active, um, and that means getting your heart rate up uh, 20, 30 minutes a day, most days of the week, so a brisk walk. And again, during this time, during the pandemic, wear your mask, watch your distance when you're out and about. So get your physical activity safely. Uh, The third thing is don't smoke and avoid people who do smoke because secondhand smoke is also bad for you. Mm-hmm. Um, try to keep your weight down to um, a BMI of 25 or under uh, and keep your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and your cholesterol uh, at good levels with medication if needed. But uh, hopefully if you follow a healthy diet and you um, uh, get physical activity, you, you may not need medication to keep your blood pressure and blood sugar and cholesterol uh, at good levels. Um, now, in terms of how to do this, Small changes uh, are easier to to make, easier to maintain, and easier to build on over time. So it's hard to change your diet on a dime from one day to the next, from from an unhealthy diet to a healthy diet. So small substitutions. um, Focus on one meal a day where you're going to try to start making healthier choices. You know, if you typically have a a sandwich at lunch, what most people don't know is that some of the largest sources of salt in the diet are in bread, cheese, and deli meats. Right, right. So if you're having a sandwich at lunch and you're, you think, okay, I've got whole wheat bread and I've got a piece of cheese and I've got some, you know, some ham or something on there, well, uh, look for bread that has less salt. Um, look for cheese that has less salt. Roast beef has less salt in it than ham or turkey. Some people think, you know, the turkey must be healthier, but turkey has a lot of salt in it if you get deli turkey. Mm. So, or switch to a salad. And if you switch to a salad for lunch, you're going to get more vegetables. You're, you know, you're going to get less salt. You're going to get less fat. Uh, and that's going to be a much healthier 
lunch or switch to a soup, but you have to watch out for the salt in the soup because there's, you know, different soups have um, more sodium in it. And sodium is a big deal when it comes to blood pressure. If you're thinking about physical activity, same kind of idea, small changes. If you're someone who hasn't really been doing any physical activity at all, don't start going out to run a 5K, right? Start by a, a walk around the block. Work your way up from walking 5 or 10 minutes to walking 15 to 20 minutes to getting that half hour brisk walking on most days. One of the biggest things that turns people off from physical activity is that they decide they're going to make a big change in their lifestyle. They go out, they overdo it early on, get injured, and then take a real step backwards. So it's important to build up to it gradually. Hmm. I had no idea that bread actually contains such a high amount of salt, but speaking of diet and exercise, I just want to get this last question out of the way. Um, if, is there such thing as doing enough exercise to offset a bad diet? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, sadly, the answer is no. Um, you, you know, we, you are what you eat, and this is really true. So uh, it's important to keep the salt in the diet down. Uh, and it's important to fuel your body with high quality food. You know, you, it's like they say, you wouldn't put poor fuel in a, um, in a high performance race car, right? So you want to put good fuel in your body so that your body is going to be at peak performance. And that what we've learned is that really means, you know, a diet that's largely plant based, uh, that is sparing with the animal products and focuses on um, fish and lean meats in moderation, uh, that, that's going to give you the fuel you need for good brain function, good heart function, good physical function. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have for you today, Dr. Goff. Uh, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity on this interview. Well, it's been a pleasure to be with you and I uh, hope you and all your uh, followers have a uh, keep their hearts healthy and stay safe during this period of time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great day. That went pretty well. Yes, yes it was. It was really good. I stopped recording. <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay, that was really good. Good job. Wait, were you nervous? <laughs> I was kind of nervous. Yeah, that was <laughs> oh, yeah that's normal. It's okay.